From Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Starring Gary Merrill and Shelley Winters in Phone Call from a Stranger. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Every day our lives cross the paths of strangers. We meet perhaps for an intimate moment, never to see them again. And in tonight's play, Phone Call from a Stranger, our stranger meets three others under most unusual circumstances. Circumstances that made him determined to know more about them. And in their original roles in this intriguing drama from the studios of 20th Century Fox, we have that outstanding actor, Gary Merrill, co-starring with the glamorous Universal International star, Shelley Winters. Now, phone call from a stain stranger, starring Gary Merrill as David Trask and Shelley Winters as Binky. <laughs> That night, I made up my mind to leave. I waited until Jane had put the children to bed. Then I packed the bag and went out to the airport. I had my choice of destination. I picked Los Angeles. Then I went to a booth and phoned the house. David? But where are you? Where are you phoning from? It doesn't matter, Jane. I just wanted you to know that I haven't gone off to do anything foolish. It's, it's nothing like that. Then what is it, David? I just couldn't stand it any longer. I'll, I'll have to figure out another way of living without you. That's all. David, please, if I could just see you. Tell the kids I was called away in a case. I'll work out some other explanation when I've had more time to think. Just don't let them know yet. But where are you going? I'll let you know when I get there. David, darling, please, please don't go away, please. Why not? You don't think you'll be lonely for long, do you? Oh, haven't you ever made one mistake in your life? It's no use, Jane. Just, just look out for the kids. I'll let you hear from me in a day or so. <laughs> I went into the restaurant. I killed some time over a cup of coffee. It was pretty crowded, so there wasn't much I could do about it when a girl came up and sat down at the same table. You mind, mister? There aren't any other tables. No, no, go ahead. Sit down. Thanks. Uh, I saw you at the ticket window. Are you going on Grand Canyon Airways, too, huh? Uh, yes. Yes, I am. Me, too. Yes, sir? Oh, just coffee, please. Uh, yeah, coffee. Oh, and will you give me a donut, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, say, you think it's all right to fly in all this rain? Why, well, I, I don't think the rain matters. Not even at night? I don't think so. I hope you're right. This will be my first time up. I sure wouldn't want it to be my last. You're not really nervous, are you? Oh, I'd be okay if I could only figure out one thing. Oh, what's that? What holds it up there? <laughs> what do you care? That's their business. They can't blame you no matter what happens. Oh, you mean they can't sue me even if it falls? They can't. And I'm a lawyer, too. Oh, well, what am I worried about? Uh, excuse me, but we're so crowded. You mind if these gentlemen sat here, too? They're taking the same flight. No, no, not at all. Oh, thanks. At this table, please. Coffee for me, doll baby. How about you, Doc? Same for me, please. Uh, you just came in from Cleveland, huh? Yeah, I'll say. Like we was on a roller coaster. What do you mean? <laughs> the last 50 miles upside down. <laughs> Is he kidding? I can see the papers already. Among the bodies identified... That's was... not funny, mister. Mm -hmm. Joking about people might get killed. This is the young lady's first flight. Oh, sorry, honey. Just clowning is all. Yeah, well, let's not clown about this one till we get there. You're a traveling salesman, aren't you? Hey, get her. How'd you guess? Oh, I don't know. I guess the way you kid around. <laughs> Salesmen always kid a lot. You want to know something else? Do yeah. I? You're all married. The three of you. All married. <laughs> Does it show from here? <laughs> you are, aren't you? Well, I am. I'm good and married. Aren't you? Mm, yes. Oh, I knew it. I can take a married man just as far as I can see him, unfortunately. You want me to guess what you are? Well, I... I don't know whether I do or not. You're an actress, aren't you? Thanks. You scared me for a minute. Musical comedy. Yeah, and nightclubs. No kidding. What do you do, sing and dance? Both. 
Uh, did any of you gentlemen happen to see Let's Go? Uh, that was a show in New York. Why, yes, about a year ago, wasn't it? Uh, you remember Thank You So Much, Daddy? I beg your pardon? The song I sang, Thank You So Much, Daddy. Yes, I remember it. I, I saw it with my wife. Well, let me tell you about this here number. This is the only song I got in the show. And then out of town, some head shrinker wants to throw it out. But then I get this idea, and brother, from then on, it was in but good. Yeah? What idea? I did a strip with it. <laughs> yes. Don't you remember? Yes, I remember. See what I do. Arf, 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 arf. Hey, doll face, what happens to our cup of coffee? <laughs> We sat there talking, the traveling salesman doing most of it, and I learned that the man with him was a doctor. Well, the plane took off. The girl was still frightened, so she asked if I'd mind if she sat next to me. Babies fly nowadays like it was crawling from the dining room to the kitchen. But me, just feel my hands are absolutely clammy. Uh, tell me something. If, if you're so nervous, why fly? Well, the train's too slow for the way I feel. I've been away for over a year now, and... You know how it is when you get that old feeling. I, I just can't get back to him fast enough. Did you, uh, you have a long run in that show? Oh, lousy. Died in six weeks. And what did you do then? Well, not much of anything. That's why I'm going back. You heard of success stories. Well, me, I'm a no success story. Well, didn't you try for another show? Oh, sure. All of them. I even auditioned for South Pacific. And what did they say? Thanks very much. I'm surprised. I, I thought you were very good. Thanks. But after Let's Go, I was strictly a stripper. Uh, not that I got anything against stripping, but uh, it's the real deal. you got to be able to keep them on. Uh, for instance, when you're... Hey, hey, what's that? Just a little bump. Nothing at all. Huh, nerves, I guess, huh? You, uh, you go through life like this? You mean worrying? Worrying unnecessarily. About things you can't do anything about. I don't know how unnecessary it is, but aeroplanes got a very high priority on my worrying list. <laughs> well, try to relax a little. Aren't you sleepy? You kidding? Well, do you, you mind if I take a little nap? Oh, no, go ahead. You sleep. I'll watch. Thanks. Mr. Trask, you asleep? Hmm? Huh? Oh. <laughs> no. My name is Carr. Uh, my stage name is Binky Gay, but my real name is Mrs. Bianca Carr. Thank you. Well, I meant as, as long as we'll be together all night, we might as well know each other's names. <laughs> now go on, go back to sleep. I saw that the traveling salesman was looking at me, and he winked very broadly. Outside, the storm was getting worse. They flashed on the sign, please fasten your safety belt. And I saw another light. The pilot wanted to see the stewardess. Maybe it was just my imagination, but when she came out, her smile seemed much too cheerful and professional. We'll be landing in just a few minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Be sure your seat belts are fastened, please. We're in Salt Lake already? No, sir. Salt Lake is closed in. We're going to land at Vega until the weather improves. It's getting kind of icy out there. Huh? Ice on the wings, huh? Well, a little, maybe. That's why the pilot wants to... What did you say? We're perfectly all right, miss. We'll be on the ground in just a moment now. Well, you just lost me, sister. From now on, I walk. <laughs> there was a small airport, bleak and lonely on the edge of the desert. And we sat around wearily and waited while the rain beat down. Hey, Pinky, Doc, I just got an idea. You too, Trasky. Well? Well, here we are. See, we never heard of each other four or five hours ago, and now we're just like the regular four musketeers, <laughs> talking together, chewing the fat, just like we was old friends. So? Well, don't you think it'd be a nice idea to have a little record of it? Here, here, to take my business card. Go ahead, take one. Doc, Trasky, everybody take one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Hey, get this. Edmund Vincent Hope, <laughs> Pioneer Novelty Company. That's me, all right. H-O-K-E. You kind of hit a clinker on the last one, didn't you? <laughs> Listen, Mousy, anybody who calls herself Binky Gay enters such a discussion under a distinct handicap. <laughs> now, what about you, Doc? Care to give us your name and address? Well, I should have some cards with me. Yes, yes, I have. Good. Chasky? 
Well, I'm afraid I don't have any permanent address right now. Now, How long are you going to be in L.A.? Well, I I don't know yet. Okay, then. You call us. We'll make you chairman. Which brings us to you, my good woman. Hmm? Here, write it down for each of us. Name, address, phone number. All of that trouble for my phone number. Why didn't you just ask me? No, no, it's nothing like that. (laughs) Unless, of course, you insist. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I'll fight it for a while. Good girl. Say, I've been telling you guys I was married. Would you like to see how married I really am? Here. Here's her picture. Wow. In a bathing suit yet. <laughs> Take a look, Doc. Hmm. Uh, Mrs. Hope. It ain't her uncle. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very kindly. Show it to Trasky. How did an old crock like you ever tie into a dish of cream cheese like that? Well, I've got that certain ingredient, honey, with that locked-in flavor. <laughs> Locked in is right. Well, she's, she's very beautiful. Yes, she is. Well, here you are, fellas. Name, address, and phone number. But after that picture, it looks to me like you're more liable to call hoax number than mine. <laughs> hey, Trasky, where are you going? Oh, just out to get a breath of air. Uh, but it's pouring out there. Come on. Oh. Hey, Doc, you got a picture of Miss Fortness? Sorry, no. Excuse me a moment. <laughs> I stood outside under a shelter watching the rain beat down on the landing field. My mind was full of Jane and the sound of her voice. David, please don't go away. Please don't go away. Cigarette? Hmm? Oh, oh, thanks. Edmund Vincent Hoke. You ever see such a boor? Well, he's no Prince Charming. You know what he sells? Joke novelties, fake whiskers, water glasses that leak, rings that squirt water, false teeth that clack. Well, somebody's got to sell them, I suppose. I, uh, brought a pint along. You care for a drink? Not right now, thanks. Want to make some money, Mr. Trask? I believe you said you're a lawyer. That's right. Well, I'd like to engage your services. Why? Well, when we were bouncing around up there, I got to thinking kind of clear, simple thoughts you think about when you know that death isn't so far away after all. You can see what's important in your life and what isn't. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, I think I do. And if you're married with a family, you realize that there's nothing else as important as their love and respect. You have any children? Two girls. Well, then you also know what I mean by love and respect. When that's gone, you've no idea how lonely life can be. What do you want a lawyer for? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to surrender myself to the district attorney in Los Angeles. I'd like to know what I should prepare myself for. Well, that depends on what you're seeing him about. I killed three men. No, not with a gun and not through malpractice of medicine. Drunk driving, Mr. Trask, three years ago. I see. It was a Saturday night dance at the country club. Our best friends were with us, Dr. Brooks and his wife. Sure, I'd had a few drinks, but I hadn't felt them. He called me from the hospital emergency. It was a case that Brooks and I were on together, so he went with me. He wanted to drive, but I wouldn't hear of it. Well, you can guess the rest. You hit another car. And the three of them were killed. Men in the car and Arthur Brooks. I... I came to in the hospital. The next morning, a man from the district attorney's office came to see me. Claire, my wife, was also there on the road. you know you like this, Doctor? Just one or two questions. I can come back later on. If it's you all right. Go ahead. You know what happened, don't you? He knows, Mr. Thompson. They're dead. Yes, they told me. I never saw such a wreck. You really must have been traveling. My husband was on his way here, Mr. Thompson. They'd called him. It was an emergency. Of course. You had to hurry. Uh, you were driving, weren't you? Driving? No. Oh? Are you sure of that? What do you mean? You were thrown out of the left side of the car. Dr. Brooks was driving the car. Do you have anyone who can testify to that? Yes. I can. Oh? Dr. Brooks was behind the wheel when he and my husband left the country club. Well, that's all I have to know. You're a lucky man, Doctor. Thank you for seeing me. Well, that's it, Trask. I'd lied, of course, and my wife backed me up. But she knew. 
And since then, nothing but loneliness. Now you're on your way to tell the authorities the truth about it, hmm? Yes, after three years. But don't worry too much about it. We'll be able to handle it somehow. Now, as soon as hey, we're... Hey, Frasky, Doc, man says we're going to take off. All aboard, everybody. We're going to fly ten miles nonstop this time. <laughs> Do me a favor, will you? Ride on the roof the rest of the way. <laughs> a real comedy character, this thing. <laughs> Drop dead. Um, I guess we're going to try it again, Mr. Trask, huh? You feel better? You think you'll be okay this time? Oh, sure. The pilot just told me it's all downhill from here. So we went aboard. They told us we'd be in Los Angeles in two hours. If they only knew. If they only knew. We'll continue with this week's production of the Hollywood Radio Theater in just a moment. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Dan West and the Church of the Brethren know what it can mean. Shortly after World War II began, Dan West, an Indiana farmer, addressed a men's meeting in the Church of the Brethren. He told them how, as a relief worker abroad, he'd seen children dying of starvation, although surrounding hills were rich and green. He also told them how much it would help the starving people of Europe if America could send them milk-giving cows. In full agreement, the Brethren appointed a committee to put Dan West's plan into action. Pastors asked their congregations to save their nickels and dimes and donate calves instead. Farmers, hearing of the project, earmarked newborn calves for it and raised them with special care. Pamphlets describing the heifer project were sent all over the country. The plan began to snowball, and donations rolled in from farmers, churches, students, and 4-H club members. Volunteers pledged 60 days of their time away from farms and businesses to tend the cattle on their voyage to European countries. The results have more than answered the dream of Dan West. It's been estimated that since the heifer project began, over 35,000 lives have been saved by fresh milk from American cows. And the Brethren's act of neighborliness on a world scale has been repaid by the hundreds of grateful letters they've received. Letters which prove that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of Phone Call from a Stranger, starring Shelley Winters as Binky and Gary Merrill as David Trask. <laughs> The weather was still bad, but nobody seemed nervous anymore. Not even the girl who called herself Binky Gay. She was kidding now with Hope, the novelty salesman. What about it, Mousy? You gonna be singing in L.A.? Sure like to see it. <laughs> I mean, hear you. <laughs> Why, you nasty old man. What do you mean, old? I got a good mind to write your wife. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> she can't read. <laughs> Anybody marries you, I don't believe she can even see. <laughs> She's okay now, huh, Trasky? She's beginning to get insulting again. Go on back to your seat. You're tilting the plane. Don't get tough with me, babe. I'll jam your zipper. <laughs> yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> well, I won't say goodbye now, but just in case we miss each other when we get in, don't forget... The Four Musketeers. I won't. You'll call us, huh? Like we decided, we'll get together sometime and have a few laughs. I'll call. What a joker. You know, if I really batted an eye at him, it'd be out of here like a scalded cat. You on account of his wife? I don't know. I'm not sure. But I just don't get it. There's something phony about that whole setup. A lump like him with a jug like her. Well, judging from her picture, it does seem possible that she could have done better. Done better? Looks like she lost a bet. <laughs> but you know what's really funny about it? What? He's happy. That jerk's really happy. Still figuring people out, huh? I can't help it. I can't rest till I got him pegged. You want to hear about you? I had you buttoned down long ago. If you don't mind, I'd rather not talk about it. All right. You want to hear about me? You told me some of it before. Yeah, but there's more. I got mother-in-law trouble. Ever hear of it? Vaguely. You ever hear of an old doll named Sally Carr? Vaudeville? That's right. Back in the old palace days. Big mama singer. Heart of gold stuff. Remember? 
Oh, she could really belt out a song. Yes, yeah, she was wonderful. That's my mom-in-law. Really? And every hour I spend with her is like five rounds with Sugar Ray Robinson. <laughs> you see, she's still, still trying to hang on to what she used to be. She's got this old broken-down nightclub in Hollywood. She and Mike. Mike's her son, and he's also my husband and a very nice guy. But to hear her tell it, it's Danny Kay and Sophie Tucker, only better. You see what I'm up against? Yes, I see. You can imagine how she took it when Mike walked in with me. Well, but why? You're a professional, too. Well, maybe to me, but not to Sally Carr. I was with a USO troop overseas. That's where I met Mike. Oh, but that didn't count with the old lady. Because she says if it's free, the GIs will look at anything. The truth is, she didn't like me on sight any more than I liked her. It was bing, bing, bing all the way. You know what I mean? Mm. But what about Mike? He did what a husband usually does in a spot like that. Refereeing with Mumsy in one corner and Sugar Lump in the other. So pretty soon all three of us are hanging on the ropes. And then I get this bright idea how to straighten out the mess. I'll go to New York and show the big town what I really got. Make a monkey out of the old dame. So I do the same and make a monkey out of myself. Joke over. And now you're going back, hmm? well, Why? Look, just give me Mike and a couple of kids and she can have all the rest of it. Do you think you can take Mom now, huh? After a year of loneliness, I can take almost anything. She turned her head and looked out the window, that, that faraway look. And I sat there trying to forget all that she told me and what Dr. Fortness had told me, that matter between him and the district attorney. I wanted to think about myself and about my wife. And I wondered if she told the children yet what I'd tell her when I phoned from Los Angeles. And then out of nowhere, I knew that something was wrong with the plane. The motor sounded different. The, the whole fuselage was shaking, trembling. There was a sudden frantic cry from the passengers and then the crash. <laughs> Eighteen killed in air crash. Three survived disaster when passenger plane crashes into mountains just east of Los Angeles. More to come. More to come. Three survivors. Myself and two others. But not Pinky Gay, nor Dr. Fortness, nor Eddie Hoke, novelty salesman. I was taken to a hospital, but they let me leave a few hours later. My face had been cut, my arm wrenched, but not even a broken bone. I went to a hotel and sent a telegram home to Jane. Then I sat down at the window and lit a cigarette. In my pocket were two cards and a slip of paper. Names, addresses, phone numbers. Don't forget, Trasky, the four musketeers. Just give me Mike and a couple of kids and she can have all the rest of it. Well, when that's gone, you've no idea how lonely life can be. Yes, Mr. Trask. I'd like to call Westwood, please. The number's Arizona 977. Please come in, Mr. Trask. It was so good of you to phone and now to come here. Thank you. Mrs. Fortness, I, I hope this isn't too much of an intrusion on your grief. Oh, no. No, not at all. On the phone, I... I mentioned that I'd spent quite some time with Dr. Fortness at the airport in Vega. And he spoke a lot about you and your son. Yes. He adored Jerry. Is Jerry here now, Mrs. Fortness? Well, he's, he's in his room. How is he taking it? It was a great blow to him, of course. I hope you won't consider it an impertinence if I tell you that every reference Dr. Fortness made to you was filled with such warmth and devotion that it was impossible for me not to be impressed by it. Thank you. Do you, uh, you suppose I could talk to Jerry, too? Well, I... I wouldn't advise it, Mr. Trask. Jerry's packing his things. He has an aunt in Oregon. He just informed me that he's leaving here for good. For good? In Jerry's mind, I'm responsible for... for what happened to his father. And he hates me. But how does he figure that? Well, I, I don't know. I, I mean, it... It's too mixed up to tell you. Well, I, I... I shouldn't have said anything about it. I... I do appreciate your coming here. And very much what you told me. 
I just... I just don't like to leave like this. No, I... I'm all right now. Thank you. Mrs. Fortness, what if... What if we went upstairs and talked to Jerry? He won't even let me in his room. But we could try. You're wasting your time, Mr. Trask. But if you want to, the least I can do is to let you try. This way, please. The boy unlocked his door finally and let us in. His bag was packed and he was ready to leave. There's nothing I want to talk about. Besides, my bus is leaving. I got to get to the depot. If you wait a few minutes, and if you then still want to go, I'll take you there in a cab. Jerry, I was with your father in that plane. You were in that crash? That's right. Your father and I became friends. That's why I'm here. To see if we can't talk this thing over a little. You mean with Mother? I should think so. No. All right, Jerry. I won't say a word. Why are you leaving, Jerry? She knows. Ask her. You're sure she knows? She knows the whole thing. That didn't stop her from sending my father out of his own house. You think I don't know why he kept going away, but I do. I've known it all along. He went away to drink, didn't he? Well, he couldn't help it. He couldn't. He couldn't help it anymore than you can help from getting TB or pneumonia. You're supposed to feel sorry for a man like that. Not drive him away from his own home. Jerry, maybe your father went away only because he didn't want you to know. Oh, sure. Everything was his fault. She didn't do anything. She just wouldn't even talk to him. And all the time he loved her more than he did me. Jerry. I know he never said so, but he did. I could tell. And my loving him just wasn't enough for him. Now let me go. No. No, Jerry. Not until you promise to behave yourself. And get it through your head. I didn't come here just to listen to a lot of whining nonsense. That's not the way to handle my son, Mr. Trask. Now, please, I... I'd prefer it if you left. Not until I've explained one thing to him about his father. I don't want to hear it. I'm afraid you'll have to. What about his father? The other night, Dr. Fortness engaged me as his attorney. And if I learned anything from what he told me, I learned this, Jerry. That your father was prepared to go to any lengths to try to make up for the terrible thing he'd done to you and your mother. That's not true. He never did any harm to anybody. You remember that automobile accident? Of course I remember. Three people were killed. And that's, that's when all your troubles started, wasn't it? Well, what if it was? Were you at the country club that night, Jerry? No, of course not. Then you wouldn't know whether your father was drunk or not, would you? Who says he was? Just what are you trying to do, Mr. Trask? Straighten him out, that's all. Well, I won't permit it. You have no right to shake his faith in his father. I forbid you to say such things to him. Jerry, Dr. Brooks wasn't driving the car that night. It was your father. And your father was drunk. Did she tell you that? Of course not. He did. I don't believe it. Your mother knew, Jerry. She heard your father tell that lie to the police. And then she lied herself to protect him. I still don't believe it. But it's true. I know all this because your father wanted me to go with him to the police and tell the whole story. And whatever that would have meant, it would have been worth it to him if it brought back your respect for him. That's all, Jerry. Goodbye, Mrs. Fortness. Mr. Trask, tell me. Was he drinking when he told you this? Of course not. I don't take cases from drunks. I looked back as I walked out the door. Jerry was in her arms, crying. On the following day, I made another call. The number Binky had written down. I asked for Michael Carr, but it was a woman who came to the phone. Who is this? What do you want with Mr. Carr? My name's Trask. He doesn't know me. Uh, is this Miss Carr? Yeah. What's it all about? Well, I was on the plane Friday night. What plane? Well, the... Well, that plane from Chicago. Well, what about it? Well, I thought that your uh, son... Oh, hold, hold up a minute. Hey, you with that vacuum cleaner, you rockhead. I'm talking on the phone. <laughs> now, uh, what do you want? Well, when will Mr. Carr be in, please? You can try tonight about 8.30. It was a second-rate night spot on Sunset Boulevard, the club car. And when I asked for Mr. Carr, I got the mother again. She hustled me off to her office. But it was clear from the start that she didn't know about the plane crash or that Binky was dead. You sit down. Hey, Rockhead, you serve one more drink while I'm singing a number in your can. 
What do you want with my son? He's busy right now. Well, if I can wait for him, I... Is it about Binky? Oh, yes. You the lawyer? Well, I am a lawyer, yes. Well, if it's alimony she's after, he's not going to give her a nickel. Well, has she asked for any yet? No, but that's what you're here for. Ah, I know that dame. Uh, As a matter of fact, I'm only here to get a line on the situation. I'll give you plenty of line on it. She never cared a plug nickel for Mike. All she was after was the name and what she could get out of it. How well do you know this dame? I met her only once. Well, just let me tell you something, mister. If I'd been that girl's own mother, I couldn't have treated her any better. Nearly broke my back trying to make that marriage work. I see. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. The abuse I took from her. But you think I'll let him know it? I'd rather have cut off my arm. But last week, heaven help me, I had to tell him. uh, Why last week, Miss Because I couldn't stand to see him eating his heart out any longer. Not for her. So I'll let him have it. But good. And he decided to get a divorce. What else could he do? And her already gone a year? Did she ever tell you the way she left here? (laughs) I'll bet she didn't. Well, I'll tell you why, and it'll stand your hair on end. Right in this room it was, just one year ago. She waltzes in here with Mike, just like the old Hey, you. Binky, dear. You wish to see me, my child? The jerk here tells me you don't want me to sing in the show. Oh, I do want you, Binky, dear. But for your own good, I... Yellow, huh? I'm afraid I don't comprehend you, dear. Scared, you dope. Scared if they ever heard me sing in this trap, they'd throw rocks at you. Oh, you mortify me, Binky. What do you think I'm here for anyway? To listen to that cornball show every night? Why do you think I married this goon? But I thought you loved me, darling. Why don't you go fly a kite? But Binky, dear... My son, my son. Now listen, fat stuff. Do I sing or not? That's all I want out of you. Well, as I've explained to you, Binky, dear... Okay, okay. Well, I got one more proposition for you. Anything within human reason, daughter. My ducky, you want me to stay here. Oh, you know I do, dear. Then tell Mumsy we want 50% of the joint. But, Binky, dear... You want me to stay or not, Ducky? Uh, Mumsy, darling, would you... uh, Could you see your way clear to... Oh, son, you know I'd rather cut off my arm than deny anything to you or Binky. But after all, you already have 5%. But unless something good turns up for me on Broadway... This humble little joint is all I have to provide for my few remaining years. But when I pass on, son, it'll all be yours and hers. Binky? Sorry, too indefinite. (laughs) How much you got in the poke? In the what, dear? The poke, the safe. Come on, fat stuff, give it to me. Oh, no, no, Binky, no. You can't take her money. Why, that's larceny. Oh, shake it off. I'm cheaping out of here tonight. Oh, but if you take the money, Binky, we shall have no change for the customers. You get out of my way. Let her have it, Michael. Her need is greater than mine. Why don't you drop dead? So long, Mike. Thanks for the use of the... And that's the last we've seen of her, Mr. Trask. Incredible. And after all we'd done for her. Well, I I find myself in rather an awkward position. Yeah, I thought you would. No, no, it's not that. The fact is, I didn't come here about the divorce at all. Huh? And I'm certain that Binky never dreamed that your son had filed action. Then what are you doing here? Look, mister, just what is your racket? Well, I listened patiently to quite a story... The least I could do for Sally Carr was to give her one just as good in return. And so I did. I'm waiting, mister. Oh, oh, yes. Well, it's just that you seem to have been in some error, Miss Carr, about Binky's talents. You kidding? You ever hear that dame try to sing? I take it that you were never informed about her audition for Rogers and Hammerstein. She auditioned for Rogers? Oh, yes. The Mary Martin part in South Pacific. Miss Martin's leaving, you know, to play the part in Europe. 
Well, that audition must have been a beaut. <laughs> she won that audition, Miss Carr. But was Binky thinking of herself? No, not at all. But it was a Mr. Sawyer who conducted the audition. Well, Binky, you got the part. Uh, aren't you going to say anything? Oh, I'm grateful beyond words, sir. Uh, but I hear there'll be other newcomers to the cast. Uh, what about the part of Bloody Mary? Oh, they'll get somebody. Oh, that's a nice part. Nice? Why, for an old doll, that part's a dream. Uh, Mr. Sawyer, do you remember Sally Carr? Sally Carr? Holy smoke, what a great idea. But is she still alive? Oh, very much so. And she's still belting them out as good as ever. Oh, Mr. Sawyer, in that part, she'd be terrific. She really would. Where did you dig her, kid? Oh, she's my mumsy, uh, huh? my mother-in-law. Um, we've had our little differences, but she's still a grand old gal with a heart of gold. And as Bloody Mary, why, she'd be sheer heaven. Sally Carr. How can I get in touch with her? Oh, you needn't bother. I'll phone a friend of mine out there tonight, Mr. Trask, a lawyer. I'll ask him to talk to you. Hey, Miss Carr, that's why I'm here. But under the circumstances, I have no intention of embarrassing you with Binky's suggestion. Oh, I had no way of knowing how inexcusably she treated you. Uh, uh, yes, Miss Carr? Ah, beat it. I'm busy. It's me, Mike. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Carr. Could I uh, see you out here for a moment? It's just what I was about to suggest. You're Mr. Trask? Yes. Bartender said you were asking for me. I heard you talking to my mother just now. What was the idea? Well, the idea originally was to bring you some very tragic news. I just heard. I got a telegram a few minutes ago. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Carr. When did you see Binky? I was on that plane. Well, did she say anything? I, I mean, about why she was coming back? She hadn't received the notice of divorce, if that's what you mean. You're sure? Positive. As far as she knew, she was just coming home to you. As for that nonsense I told your mother, well, I... Skip it. Just don't be around when she finds out. Thanks, I won't. The reason I didn't stop you myself, I mean, really stop you. Well, you were giving Binky such a beautiful success. The kind she always dreamed about. Never could have. Till you gave it to her. Good night, Mike. Good night, Mr. Trapp. Thank you. I had one more phone call to make the shapely wife of Eddie Hoke, the traveling salesman. Yes, Mrs. Hoke would be at home. She'd be very glad to see me any time I cared to call. We will continue shortly with Act Three of Phone Call from a Stranger. for station identification. The curtain rises on Act Three of Phone Call from a Stranger, starring Gary Merrill as David Trask and Shelley Winters as Binky. Mrs. Hoke, the beautiful bathing beauty whose picture her husband had passed around with such pride. She was in bed, a hospital bed, with metal rings and ropes so she could move herself about. Mrs. Hoke was a paralytic. You're startled, aren't you, Mr. Trask? I suppose Eddie showed you that picture. He always did. It was greatly admired, Mrs. Hoke. But he never told people how old that picture was. As you can see, things have changed. Well, it's very kind of you to call on me. It was Eddie who was responsible, as a matter of fact. There were four of us on that plane who got rather well acquainted. The, uh, the four musketeers, he called us. The name seemed to establish some sort of bond between us. Are you going to see the other families, too, Mr. Trask? I already have. How grateful they must have been. I'm not so sure of that. But why not? Well, I barged in on people whose lives were not as uncomplicated as they might have been. 
Good heavens, whose is? I don't know. Is yours? Of course not. Nobody's is. That's what Binky said. Of one of the other musketeers. I'm sure all of us are trying to find our way out of one kind of problem or another. I suppose so. And in time, of course, we will. All of us? Yes, I imagine so. In I time. I wish I could agree. You mean your own? Oh, forgive me, this is hardly the moment. Is it really so serious? Well, to me, it couldn't be more so. Only to you? Not to your family, too? Well, to my children, of course. But not to your wife. You can't be interested in my problems, Mrs. Hoke. You know you can't. Where is she now? At home. Back home, you mean? That's it. And does she want to stay there now? She says she does. You doubt it? No, but I... I don't know that I care to be there with her. Even though you're still in love with her? Why do you ask me that? You must be here. There wouldn't be any problem. Mrs. Hope, my wife fell in love with another man. After 12 years and two children, that's what happened without my even suspecting it. Without my knowing anything about it at all. Until it was all over, she told me. Oh, she, she told you herself? Yes. That was a month ago. And I tried, I... I tried very hard to understand what had happened, to find some way to accept a fact which I couldn't think of without dying a little. But it wasn't any use. I, I couldn't do it. Have you ever thought of it the other way around? That's always the woman's argument, isn't it? And that's always the man's way of dodging an answer to it. It's different. I, uh, I wish it weren't, but it is. Have you talked to her since you went away? Once. I phoned from the airport. What did she say? She cried. But it... The memory of that mistake. It's the memory of someone else always between us. And I don't believe I'd ever be able to support it. Few men can. I know. Only the strongest. Many, many wives, of course. But only a few very strong husbands. Perhaps. I'm sorry. I have no right to say that. Would you care for a drink? There's a buzzer here. The nurse will no, be glad No, no, I, I don't think so, thank you. Mr. Trask, how did you like Eddie? Quite well. He was a lot of fun. Too many bad jokes, you mean? No, not at all. We had a very pleasant time together. Most people detested Eddie. No, I can't believe it. Loud, dull, vulgar, always horning in where he wasn't wanted. I don't believe that's a fair description of him at all. Don't you? Well, I do. Because that's just what he was. A tiresome, foolish, irritating man. And even after all these years... I still can't think what it was that made me marry him. What are you smiling at? At you, at myself, <laughs> the way we're talking. I haven't been in this house ten minutes. Two total strangers telling each other things that we'd never... That we'd never mention, perhaps, if we were old friends. Yes, you're right. Perhaps we're not quite normal, Mr. Trask. Certainly I'm not physically normal. And you're not normal either. Oh? You walked away from a plane crash that killed 18 people. It'll be a while before you're yourself again. And who knows? Maybe you're a better man. A more interesting man. The way you are right now. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, it doesn't matter. I was talking about myself, wasn't I? And why on earth I ever married Eddie... Well? I don't know. I was flighting myself in those days, and I thought he was fun. Marriage was going to be one long laugh. But it wasn't. And there came a day when I looked for happiness with someone else. In plain language, Mr. Trask, I ran away with another man. His name was Marty Nelson. We started driving to Chicago. I was sick the day we got there. Terribly sick. Marty sent for a doctor. I can't say for certain what her trouble is, Mr. Nelson, but she can't stay here in a hotel room. She's got to get to a hospital. A hospital? What, what, what is it? How did she get that bruise on her head? Well, on our way here, we stopped off at a lake, we went swimming. She, she was diving, came up under a raft. She didn't say it was anything more than a, a bad bomb. How long ago was it? 
last Thursday? Well, that's it, I imagine. Without getting technical about it, she seems to be suffering from a blood clot on the brain. Well, she was perfectly all right, just a bad, bad headache, she said. Sometimes these things develop very slowly. Well, what do you do for, for things like this? X-rays, of course, various tests, consultations, but I'm afraid we'll have to operate. There's partial paralysis already. Her breathing's been affected, and that's why we can't waste any more time. You mean she's liable to die? No, I didn't say that. It's a delicate operation, but rarely fatal. But what is quite possible, and I think you should be prepared for it, is the residual effect. Some degree of paralysis afterwards. I'm afraid that's fairly common in these cases. She'd be paralyzed? I'm only pointing out that it's a possibility, Mr. Nelson. Now, with your permission, I'll make arrangements to get her into the hospital. Yes. Yes, of course. The doctors operated, Mr. Trask. I was in pretty bad shape for several days. Marty was very attentive, or so they told me. I was too sick to know what was going on. But one day, Marty didn't come to the hospital. The doctor told me he'd phone to see how I was. But he must have made another call right after. Hello? Cashier? This is Mr. Nelson in room 1267. Will you get my bill ready right away, please? I'm leaving. I'm checking out. Thank you. It was a week before I could bring myself to realize that Marty had gone away and left me. But by then, it didn't seem to matter. Nothing did. Nothing in this whole wide, empty world. I was paralyzed. I'd never walk again. Then one day, the nurse told me I had a visitor. It was Eddie. And all he said was, Hiya, baby. Hiya, beautiful. Dull, foolish, vulgar. To some. But not to me. To me, he was a man like a rock. Nothing could shake Eddie. Nothing could shake his love. It was from him that I learned what love really was. Not a frail little fancy to be smashed and broken by pride and vanity and self-pity. That's for high school kids. But a rock as strong as life itself. I'll miss Eddie, Mr. Trask. May I, may I use your phone? Certainly. Long distance, I'd like to speak to Mrs. David Trask, person to person at Midland City, Iowa. Number is Prairie 4267. Reverse the charges, please. Hi? Oh. Valley 48269. This is Mr. Trask calling. No, no, I'll hold on. You can hand me my knitting, if you don't mind. Hi? Oh, oh, he's here. Thanks. They're ringing now. There's a phone in the other room, if you'd rather... No, no, this it. is fine, thanks. But there's, there's no answer. She must be out. Well? Yeah, but it's nearly midnight back there. Oh, for the love of peace. Yeah, but I don't understand it. We've got children there. She's got Hello? the right... Hello, David? Janie, Janie, well, where have you been? Up on the roof? Taking a shower. The phone's been ringing... Shower at midnight? But you know I always take a shower every night. Don't you remember? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, uh... How are you? We're all fine, David. How are you? I'm fine. How are the kids? I told you. They're fine. That's fine. What is it, darling? Well, Janie, I... Well, I've been thinking about it, and the way things are, if it's... And if it's all right with you... Wait, you get on that plane, and... I can't hear you. What did you say? David, do you still love me? You know I do, Janie. Oh, then please hurry. Darling, please. I will, honey. The very first plane. Just don't wait around for the train. Just tell me what time you'll be coming. Well, I don't know yet. I'll have to call the airline. We'll meet you, David. We'll all come down and meet you. I'll make reservations now, and I'll call you right back. It doesn't matter when, darling. We'll be there. But, Janie, don't you want to even hear why? I said, don't you even want to know why I'm... She hung up. She was crying. Hmm? Yes. Yes, I guess she was. Good night, Mr. Trask. Good night, Mrs. Hoke. 
It's been very nice meeting you. In a moment, our stars will return. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Louis Cass knew how important friendship is. In 1836, he resigned as Secretary of War to accept the post of Ambassador to France. It wasn't too long after his arrival there that he became friends with King Louis Philippe. But making friends with the French people was another story. Anti-American propaganda had been too well planted over the years. But one day, Cass witnessed a street fight. With the appearance of armed troops, the fighters fled, leaving a group of bystanders about to be fired on. Stepping out in front of them, Cass told the commanding officer that he, as well as the Frenchmen with him, were innocent spectators, and that to fire on them would be murder. The officer apologized and ordered his men to put up their guns. The incident marked the beginning of Louis Cass's friendship with the French people. Gradually, despite the attempted smears by other nations, Cass strengthened the understanding between his country and France, and he was eventually responsible for the signing of a treaty by America, France, and England, a treaty which guaranteed freedom of the seas to all nations. Once more, an American had proved to the world that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are to take a well-deserved curtain call. Shelley Winters and Gary Merrill. <laughs> this week, we are presenting a truly great love story. The humorous drama of one of America's most beloved men. It's Warner Brothers, the story of Will Rogers. And starring in the title role will be Will Rogers, Jr., and the winner of the box office popularity survey, a great Academy Award winner, Jane Wyman. Oh, it sounds wonderful, Irving. Good night. Good night. Good night. is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.